Okay, so when we were talking about in the sensory pathways, you know, we, we talked about, well, one, what sensory information was being carried, and then we talked about um, how many neurons were going to be involved, we called a neuron chain. So, you know, you have your primary neuron, your secondary, and your tertiary. Pretty much the primary went from the periphery out to your skin or wherever, up to the spinal cord or into the midbrain, excuse me, or into the brainstem. And then it would go up to the thalamus, you know, well, I should say it would synapse on the secondary neuron, then that would travel up to the thalamus, synapse on the tertiary neuron, and that tertiary neuron would synapse into the cerebral cortex somewhere. Okay? So that was going to be sensory information, which is going to be ascending, which means it's going to go up to the brain. Motor all right, pathways are descending. They leave the brain. They start in the brain and they head on down. All right? and they're going to head on down into the spinal cord and out of the spinal cord out to the periphery. Right? So in this pathway that we're going to talk about, right, when we're talking about motor pathways, one, okay, simple. Right, the effector organs are going to be skeletal muscles, okay? If we're talking about somatic motor neurons, right? For their visceral motor neurons, then it'll be either cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or glandular tissue, okay? But um, with the motor pathways, we're going to deal with at least two neurons. So we have the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron, okay? So the upper motor neuron is going to originate in the motor cortex, okay? and it's going to travel down, all right, and synapse with the lower motor neuron. And that lower motor neuron, it's either going to be a cranial nerve nucleus, if we're talking about cranial nerves, all right, or it's going to synapse in the spinal cord, specifically in the anterior horn, because the anterior horn, all right, that is going to be somatic motor neurons, which innervate, which innervate skeletal muscle. And in this case, it's going to excite. Okay. We'll go through a couple different things. And this is where we kind of left off. I know this is reviewed for you folks. All right. We talked about this because the first motor pathway that we jumped on board with was this one here, the direct or pyramidal pathway. Okay. This is the pathway. All right. It deals with the brain and skeletal muscles. Okay, so we're going to deal with both upper and motor nor uh, upper and lower motor neurons. Right, the upper motor neuron originates in the primary motor cortex. Okay, and then it's going to travel down. It's going to move through what we call the internal capsule, and the internal capsule is just a bunch of white matter. Okay, which is myelinated axons. Okay. Then it'll travel into the brain stem, and we go through the midbrain. It's going to travel through the cerebral peduncles. It's in the front of the midbrain. And then it's going to descend through the brain stem down in the spinal cord, and it's going to go down through the uh, brain stem as cortical spinal tracts. Remember, a tract in the central nervous system is going to be a bundle of axons. Okay, a bundle of axons. In the peripheral nervous system, a bundle of axons is a nerve. Okay, so keep that in mind. Just a different way to say a nerve, right? In the central nervous system, okay? it's not the same thing, but it's just a different way of describing the same thing. Right? In the central nervous system, we call myel excuse me a bundle of axons tracts. In the peripheral nervous system, we call a bundle of axons nerves. Okay, so then. That prime upper motor neuron is going to synapse onto a lower motor neuron in the anterior horn, all right, of gray matter, which is this on our awesome diagram that I'm really good at drawing now, all right? This is all gray matter in here. Remember that gray H? The anterior horn is in the front right there, okay? It's going to send, that's what gray matter is. Remember, gray matter is going to be cell bodies, dendrites, right, unmyelinated axons, and glial cells. Okay. So then that the upper motor neuron synapses on the lower motor neuron here in the anterior horn, and then that lower motor neuron is going to go out to skeletal muscle. Your leg, your hand, your face. It's going to go out to skeletal muscle. Okay. It's going to excite the skeletal muscle. All right, so let's talk about two specific pathways. 
right, we have the lateral and the anterior cortical spinal tracts. Now, please, I want you to get in the habit of dissecting these words here. All right, cortico, all right, that's going to stand for the cerebral cortex. Okay, so this pathway originates up there in the gray matter of your brain, and the cerebrum is going to travel down into the spinal cord. Okay, so let's start with the lateral one. Okay, the lateral one, this is important that you know this. The lateral one, a couple differences between the lateral and the anterior. Okay, the lateral one, all right, the upper motor neuron is going to decusate. What does that mean? Just decusate. See, so you do it with your hands. It crosses, right. It's going to cross. Okay, so in this situation, the, the lateral cortical spinal tract is going to decusate or cross over in the medulla oblongata's pyramids. Okay, that is the most inferior portion of your mid, uh, excuse me, I keep wanting to say midbrain, the most inferior portion of your brain stem. Okay, so it's going to cross over there, and then it's going to run in the white matter, all right, white tracks, okay, in the lateral funiculi. What's the fin lateral funiculi? Going back to my awesome drawing here. Sometimes I just wish the drawing would stay. This is the lateral funiculi. This is the posterior funiculi. This is the anterior funiculi. Okay, that's just white matter. Okay, so it's going to run right in the lateral funiculi, right, and then it's going to synapse right with or connect contact the lower motor neurons, right, and then the lower motor neurons are going to. This is again the lateral cortical spinal tract are going to innervate limb muscles. Limb muscles. It's important that you know that. Okay? So let's take a picture. Take a peek at a picture. All right, so we're going to start up in the cerebral cortex because that's where we all start. All right? I want to make sure I got the right one here. All right. Okay, so that's this one here. This is the lateral, all right, cortical spinal tract. So it starts here, the primary motor cortex here. Up in the parietal low, excuse me, the frontal low, to travel through the internal capsule here, white matter, goes down into the brain stem, the midbrain here, remember in the front, the cerebral peduncle that carries somatic neurons. Okay? So it's going to travel down into the medulla oblongata. In this case, it crosses over or decusates, okay? And it's going to travel all the way down here into the lateral funiculus, and then synapse, it's showing you it's synapsing here on an inner neuron, okay, it doesn't need to, okay, you can synapse directly onto the lower motor neuron, right, but it's going to synapse onto the lower motor neuron, and then that lower motor neuron exits out of the spinal cord through the anterior roots or rootlets here, and then it'll meet up with some sensory neurons here in the spinal nerve and go all the way out to the skeletal muscle. Okay, so this is here the left side of the body, right? But yet it's innervating skeletal tissue on the right side of the body, okay? Because, like I said, it decusates here in the medulla oblongata. So that's the lateral cortical spinal tract. Did I do this with you guys last time or, or no? I don't think I did cover this. Okay. All right. No worries. It's all good. I can't remember. All right. So for the anterior, okay? A little bit different, okay? Low, excuse me, the upper, the same kind of thing. The upper motor neuron is still going to originate in the cerebral cortex, okay? They all do. And it's going to travel all the way down, all right? And it's going to actually enter into the anterior funiculi. So it doesn't decusate, okay? So again, our anterior funiculus is right here, okay? So it's going to travel down in through the anterior funicula here, but now the anterior cortical spinal tract, it is going to decusate in the spinal cord, right? The lateral decusated in the brain stem, right? But here the anterior cortical spinal is going to decusate or cross over at specific spinal cord segments. It could be C5, it could be T8, it could be L1. Okay? It just varies depending on where it's going in the body. Okay? But it will decusate at a specific level. All right? And it can 
synapse on an inner neuron or directly onto the lower motor neuron. Now these spinal nerves, excuse me, these nerves are going to intervene, you need to know this, axial skeletal muscles. You guys remember the axial skeleton, right? Rectus abdominis, pectoralis major, right? Trapezius, quadratus, labor, well, not trapezius, all right? Disregard that. Different, uh, uh, your spinal accessory nerve, which is cranial nerve number 11, actually innervates this uh, trapezius muscle. Okay? Um, but anyways, but keep in mind, axial skeletal muscles for anterior. It's easy to remember. A for axial, A for anterior. Right? L for cortical spinal, L for limbs. Easy way to remember. You'll never forget now. Promise me. No, seriously, I want to promise from each and every one of you. All right. So let's check out the picture here. Boom. <clears throat> this chapter relies a lot on pictures, in case you haven't figured that out yet. All right. So again, we're up in the primary motor cortex here. All right. So our upper motor neuron, right, is going to do the same thing, travel through the internal capsule, down into the brain stem. The midbrain is going to travel through the cerebral peduncle here. It's going to go through the medulla oblongata, all right, but it does not. I repeat, it does not decusate here. The lateral does, but not the, meat, the anterior. Right? It's going to travel down through what we call the anterior cortical spinal tract. Okay? And when we get into the spinal cord, that'll be that white matter, right, that anterior funiculus. Okay? It'll travel through that, and then it will cross over right, at a specific spinal level. Like I said, C7. All right, C4, wherever, depending on where it's going to go, what muscle it's going to innervate. Okay, and then it'll either uh, synapse onto an inner neuron or directly onto the lower motor neuron. And then that lower motor neuron will exit out of the spinal cord and innervate the skeletal muscle. Again, okay, both of these tracks, they just cross at different places, are contralateral. Okay, they originate on one side of the body but innervate the opposite side. Okay, contralateral. All right, so those are the direct pathways, pyramidal pathways. What about the indirect pathways, okay? This is when we kind of talk a little bit about brainstem nuclei, all right? Now, they're going to be more complicated. Great, just what we want to hear, but the good news is I'm not going to get into all that detail with this. I'm just going to br briefly uh, describe all right, some of the details of the indirect pathway, okay? So for the lateral pathway, okay, again, this is going to regulate, all right, not just movements, but precise movements, again, in the limb muscles. So lateral limb, all right, but this more specifically are going to be flexor limb muscles, okay? So flexor limb muscles would be like your biceps brachii, okay, Brachy, brachioradialis, brachialis, all right, anything that's going to help flex the limb, any hip flexor muscles, any uh, knee flexor muscles, elbow flexor muscles, shoulder flexing muscles, all right? Those are the flexor limb muscles, all right? And so this has to do with what we call the rubrospinal tracts, right? And it originates in the midbrain. Like I said, I'm not going to get into do all the pathways for all that, okay? This is not a spinal anatomy class. This is an anatomy class. All right, the medial pathway, right? This is got now. This is very important that you pay attention to this. This is going to regulate muscle tone. Remember what else regulated muscle tone? For the reticular formation, the brainstem, the, the RAS has to do reticular activating system, your awareness levels, right? Like when your alarm clock goes off or when you're sleeping, right? So the reticular formation is going to be involved, all right, in the medial pathway, okay? So this will regulate movements of the head, neck, and the proximal limb, right, and also the trunk, okay? Muscle tone. So think, muscle tone, reticular formation is going to be involved, right? And that includes the reticular spinal tract, the tectal spinal, and the vestibular spinal tracts. I hate to say this, but this is going to just be pure memorization here, okay? And this, this is as much detail as I get into these indirect pathways here, all right, when we're talking about right, the, lateral, the medial pathways, all right? So for the reticular spinal tracts, 
Here's that reticular formation, right? Muscle tone. So it is going to help with reflexes when it comes to posture and balance. So you don't tip over. If I ask you to lift up one leg, stand on one leg, right? You're going to be using. Ugh, I can't talk tonight, you guys. I'm trying to rush my words. I apologize. Um, slow down. All right. You'll utilize the reticular spinal tract. Okay. The tectal spinal tract, we're a little bit familiar with this. Remember the tectal plates? When we were labeling in our lab atlas the, uh, uh, corp the corpora quadremina, the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi of the corpora quadremina. On the back here of the midbrain, you have this structure that looks like a square. It has four bumps on it. All right? That's the tectal plate. Okay? And so... The top two bumps were called the superior colliculi, and that had to do with visual reflexes. Right? And the bottom two were the inferior colliculi, and that has to do with auditory reflexes. Perfect example, right? if you're watching a tennis match and Serena Williams is playing her sister and they're hitting the ball back and forth, when your eyes are following the ball back and forth, you're utilizing the superior colliculi. Right? If you're sitting quietly on your own business in the library and someone comes up behind you and is whispering on your right side, you hear them to your right, you turn to look, you're going to be utilizing your inferior colliculi for the auditory reflexes there, okay? All right, so that's going to involve the tectospinal tract. And then finally, we have our vestibular spinal tract. All right, and again, whenever you see this term here, vestibular, you want to think of balance, equilibrium, okay? So you have these vestibular nuclei in the brainstem, and it's going to help to maintain balance. You're using them right now so you're not falling out of your chairs when you're sitting, standing, and walking. Okay? Like I said, that's as much detail as I'm going to get into. <clears throat> right, and those are the indirect pathways. All right. So if any of you are as big of fans of comic book movies as I am, Probably no. I love Superman, but I love all comic book movies. Well, Christopher Reeves was one of the earlier Superman, and he unfortunately had this addiction to playing polo. All right, which is a game that you sit on a horse and you whack a ball around with like what looks like a croquet mallet. Well, unfortunately, he had the um, uh, accident of falling off the horse. He, uh, he uh, injured his spinal cord, and I can't remember if it was C2 or C3, whatever levels those were very high. The higher you are, the more dangerous it can be. And uh, he was paralyzed and uh, quadriplegic, in fact. Um, so what had happened was because he damaged the spinal cord, central nervous system uh, uh, neurons uh, don't have the ability to regenerate like peripheral uh, nervous system neurons, right? You can sever a neuron. Now, depending if it's a small sever and you haven't destroyed too much of the tissue, uh, the peripheral nerve neurons can regenerate themselves. Peripheral nerves can regenerate themselves as long as there's not a lot of damage and there's very little inflammation. Right? So if you have a spinal cord injury, okay, you can paralyze individuals. Right? And when you paralyze individuals, then they can lose motor control. They can lose sensory sensations. Right? The inability you know, to not feel anything or just have reduced sensation uh, 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 abilities, okay? So what we usually do is we give steroids right afterwards. And why do you think we do give steroids right after? It reduces the inflammation. So there was a football player, and I apologize for not knowing his name. Uh, he played for the Buffalo Bills. And this was back, I want to say, tw between 10 and 20 years ago. And he suffered a brain, uh, 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 not brain, but a spinal cord injury on the field. And the hospital in Buffalo, New York, was uh, using this new type of therapy in which they would immerse the spinal cord in ice-cold saline. And they gave him the steroids, but the ice-cold saline, and I can't remember what the temperature was, but it was really cold saline, right? It, of course, what does ice do? When you, when you sprain your ankle, why do you put ice on your ankle? It helps, it helps to decrease the inflammation, helps to decrease the pain. That's what the saline did. So in addition to the steroids, this ice-cold saline solution created almost minimal inflammation. Because the spinal cord, any neuron, any nerve tissue is very sensitive to any type of, of um, pressure 
that can come from swelling, chemical physical pressure, or pressing on the nerve physically, like a disc herniation. So they prevented all this from occurring. So he underwent, uh, I think it was eight months. It was a long time. Now, he never went back to play professional football, but he had a neck injury to the spinal cord. He is able to walk. I don't know what he's doing now, but and he's able to, to move his hands, arms, and legs, and he's all on his own. But if that same injury occurred 20 years ago, forget about it. He'd be lucky with steroids, maybe not to be a paraplegic or quadriplegic. But um, he was walking, moving around. I don't know if he's running. I have to check. If I can remember his name, I'd like to see what's going on. Also, you get antibiotics, right? Because, of course, you have a compromised nervous tissue function. You can have compromised immune function, and so you increase the chance of having pulmonary and urinary infections. And finally, this is still relatively new, the neural stem cells, right? We are experimenting and trying to, again, regenerate, all right, uh, axons, but most importantly, central nervous system, CNS axons. It's huge, 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 huge. We're seeing that a lot. So we're messing around with stem cells quite a bit now. All right, spinal nerves. Okay, we talked about that last class. Remember, there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves that come off of your spine. We talked about it in lab. Right? There's eight uh, cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic spinal nerves, five lumbar spinal nerves, five sacral, and one coccygeal. Okay? So here's a drawing, all right, an illustration of a transverse section of the spinal cord here. And you can see here's the spinal nerve coming off. Now, in lab today, we'll talk about these branches that come up. We'll talk about the posterior ramus and the anterior ramus. All right, so I'm not going to talk about it here. We'll get into that. All right, I stopped short last time. But that leads me into, all right, so when we're, when we're talking about spinal nerves, all right, we're going to get into dermatomes. Okay, that's this thing. Ever seen any of these drawings before, diagrams? Person with all these lines on them? Those are dermatomes. All right, this is a map that's showing you which particular part of your skin is innervated by a specific spinal nerve. Okay? This is a way for neurologists, even general practitioners, doctors like myself, where if someone is having nerve issues in their low back, I can test all right, their skin sensation in these areas here if I'm suspecting low back. I can do what's known as a, a dermatome test. I use a, it's called a Wartenberg pinwheel. It looks like a pizza cutter. You've seen the pizza cutters, but with spikes on it. And you run it up and down, and you ask them, does this side feel like this side? You can do other things, too. All right? But we check certain regions here on the lower extremity because it matches up. If I zoom in, you can't really see. It matches up with certain spinal nerves, like here's the L4 spinal nerve along the um, lateral portion of the spine, then it goes on to the medial portion of the leg, right, L5, S1, all right, so these different regions here have to do with, the thoracic one is easy, it's, it's very segmented here throughout the thorax and the abdomen, right, but these certain regions have to do with specific spinal nerves, so when a patient comes into me and they say, hey, I can't feel my thumbs, what's up with that, and I'm like, well, stop doing drugs, no, I tell them, listen, all right, don't go sticking your thumbs into things you shouldn't be. I tell them, all right, let's, I go through the history and everything. But I immediately start thinking C6, all right, C6, okay, and then you can trace it up to the neck if they're having neck pain, right, or if they say, listen, I can't feel, I've lost sensation across my belly button region there, right? that's the T10 dermatome. If they say the nipple line, that's T4, T7 is going to be where your xiphoid process hangs down on your sternum there. So certain areas, when they say that they have reduced sensation or strange sensations in a specific area, then you can trace it back using the dermatome map, right? So what are dermatomes? Okay, they are areas of the skin supplied by a single spinal nerve. Now there is some overlap, but like I said, when you think of the umbilicus, or navel, or belly button, you have the T10 dermatome, right? When you think of the nipple line, that's T4, right? So certain areas here are going to be specific for certain spinal nerves, okay? So this leads me into referred visceral pain, okay? So you've heard of heart attacks. People get pain in the left arm, all right? Obviously chest pain. Women, for whatever reason, y'all get it 
more commonly than men in the jaw, okay? And don't really complain of that so much, but women do more frequently than men, I should say. But usually the left pain, the left arm pain, that's visceral referred pain, right? Appendicitis is very common. Initially with appendicitis, early onset appendicitis, you can have pain right around your belly button, okay? It's not always like that, but you can. People just dismiss it, okay? But normally, when you have appendicitis, where do you usually feel that pain? It could be, yeah, it's going to be on that on, on the same side as the appendix. It's going to be on the right side, right? So it will be down in that lower portion there in the front, okay? Right near the iliac crest there. Well, that is the T10 dermatome here. So zooming in, okay? In the beginning, now it's not always, but people will start to have pain around the umbilicus. Then it migrates over, over the, the appendix. So the appendix is down in this area here. Okay, that's referred pain. Right? Um, if anyone's ever had gall gallbladder issues, people will complain of right shoulder pain. I can't talk today. Because the gallbladder will refer pain to the right shoulder. People have pancreatitis, usually right in the middle, right here, around T7, T8. Okay? Kidney pain, all right, if you get a kidney stone, back here, here, and here, and that pain does not go away. You can stand, sit, roll over, whatever, okay? That's how you can usually tell if somebody has kidney stones. You know, uh, if they rest or lay down, that pain doesn't go away. It's a good chance that they have kidney stones. All right, which leads me into shingles, all right? Our friend shingles, if you've ever had chicken pox, you do have the ability to have shingles. Okay, because the uh, chicken pox va uh, vaccine, well, interestingly enough, people that get the chicken pox vaccine and haven't had chicken pox naturally are more prone to shingle infections, All right? Um, they're finding that out now. But uh, the uh, virus, all right, uh, I don't remember the name of it. I think it's varicella. I'm almost positive that's the name of the virus. I'm having a brain aneurysm here. Right, but regardless, when you combat chicken pox and you get over your chicken pox, if you've had it naturally, the virus goes dormant. It goes and it looks for the posterior root ganglia. What is that? It's this guy. Remember him? There's the posterior root ganglia. Okay, so here's our spinal nerve right here. And the spinal nerve splits into the posterior roots and the anterior roots. That bulge there is the posterior root ganglia. What lives in the posterior root ganglia? part of the neuron cell bodies yep or somas okay that's what lives in the posterior root ganglia okay and so chicken pox keeps it company it's inactivated so it lives there and hangs out there okay so when your immune system becomes compromised the older you get or if you become very stressed your immune system kind of backs off you can actually reactivate chickenpox virus, all right, and it'll travel down the sensory axons in whatever dermatome that it was living in, okay? And along, it's craziest thing. Along that dermatome, you'll start to see blisters and a rash. Very painful. Has anyone here had shingles before? Uh, talk to some older people. I've never had it, but I've seen it. And uh, not a pain. You have? So, Casey, then you probably know. It doesn't feel good, does it? Do you mind if I ask where it was? Is it on your back or your face? Extremely painful, yeah. Um, uh, I don't think it was a patient of mine, but I talked to somebody and they got it on the trigeminal nerve along your rib cage. Okay, yeah. We'll see it more in the thorax and the abdomen, but if you are unfortunate enough to get it in the trigeminal nerve, which is the nerve that will help to innervate your face, right? And if it's bad enough and get into your eye, bad. Yeah, I know. I can see your eyes. I can't see your face, Anna, but I can see your eyes. But it's very painful, right? And so usually what they give is an antiviral uh, and steroids, okay, to help treat it, okay? And, and that varies depending on the severity of it. You could be on it for six months. Uh, this one lady that I worked with, her daughter got it really bad, and she was on steroids for over six months. And she had a really bad case of it. All right. Woo, let's jump into reflexes. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm telling you folks, you guys can't even see me. 
I'm going to tell you folks at home this too. When I'm talking about reflexes, folks really should, if you plan on taking 211, really pay attention to what I'm going to go into because you get into digestion, right? When you get into the endocrine system, right? When you're going to get into a lot of these other systems in 211, this concept comes back. If you understand it now, when you have to, when you're learning that information again, you know, that pertains to that specific system, it'll be much easier for them, for you. Okay. Well, it's already easy for me, but it'll be much easier for you. All right. So what are reflexes? This is important that you understand this. All right. They are one rapid, pre-programmed, involuntary responses, right, of muscles or glands. Most importantly, they have to be a response to a stimulus. So you need a stimulus in order to initiate a reflex. That's a great test question, right? True, false. Do you need a stimulus to initiate a reflex? True. Yes, you have to have a stimulus, okay? So in order for a reflex to occur, a stimulus has to hit. Like when you go in, you sit there in the doctor, and they take the reflex hammer, and they smack it on your, your, your knee, that's the stimulus. When they tap you on the knee with that reflex hammer, right, it evokes that little jerk there, okay? So the, the, the response has to be rapid, okay? And in a lot of cases, reflexes are a survival mechanism, all right? They were there way, way, way back with our ancestors over time and time and time, right? And a lot of times it kept them alive. It saved their lives, all right? So they have to be fast. And the fewer neurons that you have involved, the faster it is, okay? So if you only have two neurons involved, that's going to be a quick reflex compared to three to four neurons, okay? So the fewer the neurons, the quicker the reflex, okay? And we'll talk about that, right? So that goes back to those chain of neurons that we talked about, right? It's pre-programmed. What that means is every response is going to be the same every time, okay? Because it's programmed into you. And it's involuntary. You can't think it over. Because it could be a life or death situation. Right, should I jump into this tree? You know, I got this tiger chasing me. Mm, I don't want to break the branch in the tree, you know. Whatever. Right? You don't have time. So it's an involuntary response. Right? So usually by the time you realize that whatever the response is, it's already happened after the fact. Okay? All right. So let's jump into the components of, of the, what we call reflex arc, right? And I'll go through the reflex arc, right? There's a couple different stages to it, okay? So the first one is the stimulus. You have to have a stimulus to initiate, all right, a reflex. So that's number one, okay? And then that stimulus is going to create a nerve signal that's going to travel along. Now this this picture here is showing us right, that we have a pain stimulus here from this nail being jabbed into the skin. Right? And that's going to stimulate these pain receptors that are going to create and send nervous signal information along the sensory neuron right, to where? Our control center. And remember back in chapter one, receptor control center effector? Right? That's what a stimulus is. That's homeostasis. Right, but we're just going to make it a little bit more detailed now. So we have a stimulus, and we have a receptor that monitors that stimulus. Then we're going to transmit that information up the sensory neuron here into our spinal cord. And our spinal cord in this example is our control center. Okay, that's the control center there. Okay, so that nervous signal right enters into the spinal cord. Right, and it gets processed. Right now, you can see here there's an inner neuron here. The inner neurons will process that information. And then they'll determine if you're going to have a, a reaction to it or a response. Because if it's an inhibitory uh, inner neuron, it'll just shut everything down and you won't have a motor response. Okay? If it's an excitatory, because that's what inner neurons are, it's a binary thing. It's either yes or no, on or off, excitatory or inhibitory. We're talking about inner neurons, okay? So this inner neuron here, right, will either excite or inhibit this motor neuron, okay? So it's going to process that information, right? It is our control center, right? 
And then in this case, it's going to excite it, okay? So it's going to send that excitatory information and create an excitatory nerve signal down our motor neuron all the way to the effector organ. In this case, it's the skeletal muscle, okay? That is our reflex arc. You need to be familiar with that, okay? In the same type of scenario, you're going to see this, and it, hopefully it won't be so far away, stored somewhere in some deep, dark recess of your brain when you're learning about this. But let's think about when you're digesting some food, okay? You eat some food. Okay, the food is going to be the stimulus as it starts to accumulate in your stomach. It's going to start to stretch the stomach, and it's going to activate stretch receptors. Okay, those stretch receptors are going to send information, sensory information, up to all right the hypothalamus, saying, "All right, no more. Don't eat. Don't eat anymore. We're stretching out." The hypothalamus will then send information back down to the motor neurons, and giving you that sensation of feeling full. Right? But at the same time, it'll stimulate those motor neurons to start contracting and relaxing the stomach walls. It'll start churning the muscle, the muscle, start churning the food that's in there. Then you'll start to also secrete digestive enzymes, all right? hydrochloric acid and all that fun stuff you're going to learn about all right, when you get into digestion. So it's a very similar type of scenario there. All right, so let's classify some of our spinal reflexes here. Okay. So there's five different ways that we're going to be classifying spinal reflexes. One is, are they spinal or cranial? Does that mean, right, does it involve the spinal cord or the brain? That's going to be your control center. Some reflexes don't make, go past the spinal cord. They don't need to because if they go up to the brain, it's going to take more time. Okay? Is it going to be somatic all right, or visceral? That's easy. That, that's when we're talking about the effector. Well, if it's somatic, then it's only one tissue that we know that's somatic. What is it? Skeletal muscle. Oh, yeah. Okay? So if it's somatic, it's skeletal muscle. If it's visceral, then it's the re remainder. Cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or gland. Okay? Is it monosynaptic and poly or polysynaptic? Now, if you look at the terms, mono meaning one. Does that mean there's only one synapse? If there's only one synapse, that means we just have two nerves. If it's polysynaptic, that's going to be more than two. So well, monosynaptic, all right, has uh, less neurons, means it's going to be faster, okay, more rapid. Polysynaptic, involve more neurons, it's going to be a little bit slower, okay? This one's easy, ipsilateral, contralateral, all right? Is the stimulus and the effect going to be on the same side of the body, or are they going to be on opposite sides, okay? And then finally, is it innate or acquired? Are you born with the reflex? Perfect example. Suckling reflex that babies have. That's an innate reflex. They're born with that. Okay? Or are, do you develop it after birth? Okay? Which we, we develop the withdrawal reflex. We'll develop the um, uh, stretch reflex. We'll talk about some of these. Okay? All right. So here's an example of monosynaptic and polysynaptic reflexes. You can see here on our left side, the monosynaptic has our sensory neuron. It directly synapses on the motor neuron, then the motor neuron is going to go and affect the effector organ. That's a monosynaptic, that's the stretch reflex. When you get tapped with the reflex hammer, that's monosynaptic. Fast, rapid. <clears throat> All right, the other type of reflex is the polysynaptic. Okay, this is the withdrawal reflex, like if you touch a hot stove or something. And we have our sensory, all right, neuron that's going to synapse onto an inner neuron. Then that inner neuron will synapse onto the motor neuron and then affect the effector organ. Okay, so there's going to be, all right, more than two neurons involved in a polysynaptic. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about the four common spinal reflexes. Okay? These reflexes only have to do with the spinal cord. And there's four of them. Stretch reflex, the Golgi tendon reflex, right? Withdrawal reflex, and then the extensor, excuse me, the cross extensor reflex. <clears throat> the first two reflexes have to do with proprioceptors. So you've heard me talk about proprioceptors and how they have to do with, you know, limb spatial awareness and whatnot. But now we're going to get a little bit more specific. Okay, 
So I have to define something for you while we get in on this, all right? First is what a muscle spindle is, okay? Muscle spindle is the specific name that we get to, a, that, excuse me, that we give to a proprioceptor, right, that monitors the amount of stretch in a muscle. It's important, right? What happens if you stretch your muscles too far? You can tear it, you can damage it, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay, so it's important. <laughs> You know, there's a scene, uh, Captain America, has anyone ever seen the Winter Soldier Marvel movie? Anyways, there's this helicopter that's taken off of this building, and Captain America goes and holds on to the building, and he's holding on to the helicopter. He's literally trying to do a bicep pull, pull, you curl, pull the helicopter back toward Really cool. I'm thinking the whole time, I can't enjoy movies when I'm thinking this. I'm like, man. You know, he's going to tear that muscle. He's, he's going to have to be invoking his stretch reflex, you know. But that's what's happening, right? So it monitors how much stretch right, is occurring in this muscle, right? And that's this muscle spindle, okay, which is just a fancy name for proprioceptor, okay? So what exactly is involved or what is a, what is a muscle spindle? All right, let's, do, let's define it for you. We're going to even get a little bit more specific here, okay? Right. Muscle spindle is made up of what we call intrafusal muscle fibers and extrafusal muscle fibers, okay? So the intrafusal muscle fibers will be deep inside the muscle spindle. I'm going to show you a picture here, so don't freak out. But it's innervated by gamma motor neurons. And then the bigger fibers, all right, are, there, are what we'll find more exterior, right, are the extrafusal muscle fibers, and they're innervated by the alpha motor neurons. So let me show you a picture. I'll come right back to the slide. This is what I'm talking about. This is a picture here of a muscle fiber. Okay. Excuse me, muscle fiber, dear. Muscle spindle. All right, so here's your muscle spindle, this whole structure. Okay. Right? You can see here on the inside, right, you've got your intrafusal muscle fiber, which is this little bundle here. And then on the outside, you have your extrafusal muscle fiber. Both are innervated by motor neurons. Okay? The intrafusal one has the gamma motor neurons. Right? Those are smaller, by the way, so it means they're not as fast. Right? And then you get the big extrafusal muscle fiber. That's innervated by the alpha motor neurons. Alpha motor neurons are the largest type of motor neuron. That means they're the fastest. All right? But important enough is on the inside here where we see the intrafusal muscle fiber, you've got all these sensory nerve endings that are wrapped around the intrafusal muscle fiber, okay? So these nerve endings are monitoring the amount of stretch that's going on with the muscle, okay? So they will send information, all right, up to the spinal cord, all right? We'll get to that. Let's jump back to this. Okay, wait, not that, this, okay. So basically what happens when we start to stretch that muscle, that's going to then stimulate those sensory neurons there to fire nerve signals, all right, and send that information to the spinal cord, okay. So those little blue, these little blue <clears throat> sensory receptors down here, or nerve endings here, all right, they're monitoring how much stretch is going on, all right? So little bits of, of, stra of stretch will send information to the spinal cord. It doesn't mean that you're going to react to it. It doesn't mean you're going to get a response, all right? But it's always sending information to the spinal cord here, all right? All right, so now we're going to talk about the steps of the stretch reflex, okay? So... Keep in mind, the stretch reflex is to prevent a muscle from being stretched too far. So its response is going to be the opposite. Okay, so if we're stretching something, we want to prevent damage, we're going to contract the muscle. Prevent it from being stretched, because if the muscle contracts, it can't be overstretched. Okay, so that's what we refer to the reflexive contraction here. Okay. Of course, what detects it? Our muscle spindle, which we already talked about. So you already know that story. 
right? Those sensory nerve endings are monitoring that stretch and they fire that information, all right, through the spinal cord, okay? So our muscle starts to get stretched beyond safe limits, right? So those sensory nerve endings fire impulses to the spinal cord. That's this right here, okay? So it's getting stretched too far. And for our example here, this is the muscle fibers in the triceps brachii muscle, which is this muscle depicted here in the arm. Okay, triceps brachii muscle. Are, are you folks familiar with agonist and antagonist muscle groups? I may have briefly mentioned it, but I know it's in the study guide. Okay, all right. So the agonist and antagonist groups, their, their actions are opposite of one another. Okay, so for example, the biceps brachii muscle, right, is a flexor of the elbow, right? So as I flex the elbow, all right, the biceps brachii muscle is contracting, right? And the triceps brachii muscle is being inhibited. It's relaxed. Because otherwise, if I'm contracting both muscle groups, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing will happen. If I'm contracting my biceps and I'm contracting my triceps, it's not going to move. Right, so one has to be more than the other, or one has to be working, and the other one has to be doing nothing. So when I flex my elbow, the biceps brachii, my agonist is contracting, and my antagonist, the triceps brachii, are doing nothing. Now when I go to straighten my elbow, the triceps brachii now are contracting, and I'm extending my elbow, and the biceps brachii are relaxing. Right, all right. So agonists and antagonist muscles do opposite of each other. Okay, back to this. Okay, so now, all right, meanwhile in the spinal cord, right, now we have to contract the muscle because that muscle is being stretched too far. So we're gonna excite the alpha motor neurons. Right? Those are those big muscle neurons, all right, that are going to cause a contraction. Okay, this will be monosynaptic. So, pop over here. Let's zoom in, it's hard to see on the. Okay, so here comes our sensory information. Hey, hey, we're stretching the muscle too far. We got to fix this, no problem. All right, this one branch comes down here and directly synapses, okay, onto this alpha motor neuron. Okay, and that alpha motor neuron. Right, is going to then stimulate right, that muscle since it's being stretched. We have to start to contract that muscle. So it is going to start to cause the triceps brachii muscle since it's being stretched too much to contract and stop stretching you. Instead of being lengthened, because that's what happens, right? When you stretch a muscle, aren't you lengthening the muscle? Right? So now we need to shorten the muscle. So that's why we're going to stimulate right, the alpha motor neuron. Okay, that innervates the extrafusal muscle fibers, those are those big fibers over here, those big guys. Right? It's going to stimulate those to contract. Okay, and the triceps break out because it's being stretched too far. Now, meanwhile, okay, <clears throat> what we need to do is, like I said, we can't just contract both muscle groups because then nothing will happen. All right, so meanwhile, at the same time, that same sensory neuron is going to stimulate or excite the inner neuron to inhibit the motor neurons of the antagonistic muscle group. And in this example, that's the biceps muscle, right? Read, okay, because we're contracting the triceps and the biceps at the same time, nothing's going to happen, okay? So that's what happens here. Get over there. Okay, so the, now the sensory neuron at the same time is going to stimulate this inner neuron. Because remember, an inner neuron can either excite or it can inhibit. That's what the plus and the minus signs mean. Okay, so the plus here, all right, tells me that it's exciting this motor neuron. Well, in this case, the sensory neuron is going to stimulate this inner neuron to inhibit, all right, the alpha motor neuron that goes to, it's hard to see in this picture, but it goes to the biceps brachii muscle. 
So it prevents the biceps brachii muscle from contracting, keeps it relaxed. So that way we can now contract the triceps. So we don't stretch, all right, the muscle and damage the muscle. That whole concept of stimulating one muscle group and inhibiting the other muscle group is called reciprocal inhibition. Okay, that's what I just described to you. Reciprocal, very important, right, that you know this, inhibition, right, because we are inhibiting the antagonist muscle group. Right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I mean, in theory, yes, you're absolutely right. It would. It would. I mean, they're both getting uh, um, stimulated at the same time, but I mean, we're dealing with milliseconds here, but yeah, <laughs> it would. Okay. So, this type of reflex, the stretch reflex, right? When we go through our classification, it's a spinal reflex because it doesn't involve the brain, right? It's somatic because we're dealing with skeletal muscle tissue, right? It is considered monosynaptic because the actual reflex is dealing with that ipsilateral tricep brachii, right? So it stays on the same side and it's innate. All right, that was the stretch reflex. That's the first one. Let's get into the second one. All right, so get the hang of this. I think that out of all the chapters, this chapter is probably the most important one in regards to being able to see the pictures. The pictures are helpful, at least for me. Right? When I when you read this stuff, it's hard to figure it out, but when you look at the pictures, I think it's a little bit easier. Okay, so the second of the spinal reflexes is going to be the Golgi tendon reflex. So we learned about what happens when you stretch something too much. What happens if we contract something too much? And okay. yeah, we're gonna yeah we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about that now. I don't want to get a cramp because I want to use the Golgi tendon flex. This is gonna help me out. Okay, so this reflex is gonna prevent a muscle from contracting too much. Okay, so now there's a, a, a new structure that we're gonna talk about. And that's a Golgi tendon organ, okay? And this is, like I said uh, before, these two reflexes, the stretch reflex and the uh, 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 Golgi tendon reflex, both involve proprioceptors. So the Golgi tendon organ is a proprioceptor, right? We're going to see this proprioceptor where the muscle and the tendon, all right, that junction there, right? That's where we'll see these proprioceptors. All right, so these proprioceptors are going to involve excitation of an inner neuron found in the spinal cord. Okay, so remember, proprioceptors are sensory structures. So the, that, those sensory uh, uh, neurons or axons are going to excite an inner neuron found in our spinal cord here. All right, so quickly, we'll jump over here to our picture. You know me, I already got a picture. Okay. So here you can see, all right, our tendon muscle uh, uh, junction here, and that's where we're going to see these Golgi tendon organs. Okay? So they are able to monitor the tension, how much a muscle is contracting. And when they start to get that information of a muscle contracting too much, it's sending its information along the sensory neuron here, right, into the spinal cord, where we're going to involve inner neuron. Okay, we just talked about that. All right, so that's the first step. All right, so some, not all, but some of those excited inner neurons will actually inhibit, right, the motor neurons of the same muscle. That makes sense, right? If a muscle is contracting too much, you want to shut it off, right? I mean, when you have a fire and it's getting out of control, you don't pour more fuel on it, you know? We want to starve it, all right? So we want to shut off that muscle, all right? So that muscle is going to start to relax, okay? And then some of the other, all right, inner neurons there are now going to excite the motor neuron of the antagonistic muscle group. And this is referred to as reciprocal, this is important, 
activation. Okay, we learned about what reciprocal inhibition was. That's easy. We turned off the antagonist group, right? And we were talking about the stretch reflex. So we are inhibiting that. That's reciprocal inhibition. In this situation, we're going to activate right, our antagonistic muscle group. Right? So that's called reciprocal activation. Again, another polysynaptic reflex. We are going to stimulate the contraction of the antagonist muscles. Let's look at this in a picture. The picture says a thousand words. All right. So here we can see all right, that sensory information coming along. A little bit more. All right. And it's going to excite the inner neurons. In this situation, we're not going to we're not going to involve inhibition of the inner neurons. We are going to excite the inner neurons. The first inner neuron that we excite is going to shut the show down. All right? So it's going to inhibit or deactivate the motor neurons that are going to cause the, the, the muscle that's contracting too much, it's going to shut those motor neurons down and cause that muscle to relax. So in this situation, we're looking at the quadriceps femoris muscle contracting too much. Okay? So what we've done is we've inhibited it. Okay? So we shut the motor neurons. So now it stops contracting. At the same time, simultaneously, right, the sensory neuron is going to excite the inner neuron. That inner neuron is now going to excite alpha motor neuron that goes to the antagonistic muscle group of our quadriceps femoris muscle, which is the hamstrings muscle. And it's going to cause the hamstring muscle to contract, thus causing the knee to bend. As the quadriceps straighten the leg and the hamstring muscles bend the knee. Okay? So in this situation, we're going to get our reciprocal activation is we are going to activate antagonistic muscle group, okay? And that's our Golgi tendon reflex. See, now how nice is that? We just learned the stretch reflex, the reflex that happens when your muscles stretch too much. Now we just learned about the reflex, what happens when your muscles excessively contract. So we have these mechanisms built into our bodies to prevent that from happening, which is nice, prevent injury, okay? Well, here's another muscle reflex. Yes, ma'am. So it will contract. Or are you talking about the Golgi tendon organ reflex? Say that one more time. Correct. Yes, we're going to inhibit the antagonist. Yep, yep, exactly. Yep, if you want to think of it like that, sure. All right. So another spinal reflex, this is the third out of the four, all right? This one is another reflex that helps to protect us from getting hurt, right? The withdrawal reflex. And I'm sure we've all experienced this reflex at one time or another. I know we have. I have never met anybody that's taken my class that hasn't experienced the withdrawal reflex. And now you get to understand why, right? So whatever part of the body right, that encounters a painful stimulus is going to pull away, okay? So the example that we'll use is the lower extremities, okay? So you're going to pull that body part away from a painful stimulus. And your pain receptors, we'll learn more about this in Chapter 16, those are called nociceptors, okay? So we're going to stimulate nociceptors, our pain receptors, which are just sensory receptors, and they're going to transmit that pain information to your spinal cord. Okay? And it will actually excite the inner neurons there. Okay? So those inner neurons now will excite the motor neurons to the flexor muscles. Okay? This applies to upper extremity, but the picture that we're going to use in the book has the lower extremity. And that's going to cause the limb to contract and withdraw. If you think about it, if you... If you're holding on to a hot pot or about to, you touch it, right, and you burn yourself, your biceps brachii muscle is going to contract. So you're going to bend your elbow. If you're walking along and you step on, <laughs> those of you that have had kids, and I've done this in the middle of the night, you step on a sharp Lego in the middle of the night and it's dark, you know, after cursing, not after cursing, yeah, actually the cursing comes 
afterwards, but you withdraw, you step on something sharp, you pull your foot away, right? So you are going to contract the flexor muscles. You're going to bend your knee, okay? So that's what's going to happen here. The withdrawal reflex is going to contract the flexor muscles, right? So that causes the withdrawal of the limb, okay? Now, at the same time, although all this is going on while you're withdrawing, all right, that limb, you have to inhibit, remember, reciprocal inhibition, right? We have to inhibit the motor neurons of the extensors because if we're contracting the extensor muscles at the same time we're contracting the flexor muscles, what's going to happen? Nothing, yeah, nothing will happen. You won't move, all right? So we have to inhibit the extensor muscles so we can withdraw, not just withdraw, but we need to withdraw quickly. All right, so let's quick, 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 quick picture. Okay, oops. All right, so let's just focus on the withdrawal reflex first. All right, don't pay attention to the right side of the screen, just the left side. All right, same type of scenario. Well, you can kind of see what's going on. All right, so you're walking along, yada, yada, and you step on a sharp stone. Ouch. Okay. So that pain travels up the nociceptors. All right. Now, excuse me. That pain is sensed by the nociceptors, and that signal travels up the sensory neuron all the way here into the spinal cord. Okay. Same story. I think we're all pretty good on that, right? Look at about the first part of the reflex arc stimulus. <laughs> sensory neuron picks up that. All right. So. Then what will happen is that sensory neuron is going to synapse on an inner neuron, okay? And it is going to cause that inner neuron to excite, right, the motor neuron, right, that goes to the flexor muscles. And so the muscle signal comes down, and it's going to stimulate the hamstrings here, okay, to contract. And they flex the knee. They bend the knee, pulling the knee away, okay? Guys feel good about that? The withdrawal reflex? At the same time, though, right, it is going to inhibit, right, the muscles. It's not here in this picture here. Right? It's going to inhibit the quadriceps femoris muscle, okay, because that's an extensor muscle, right? So that withdrawal reflex, you're going to stimulate the flexor muscles, but at the same time, we're going to inhibit all right, the motor neurons that go to the extensor muscles. Okay? This all happens at the same time. So you can pull away, withdraw. Okay? All right. Which brings me to, last but not least, the crossed extensor reflex. Okay? So, one more thing to add. Right? So if you notice in this picture here, right, your right leg is withdrawing, what's your left leg doing? Yeah, it's standing straight up because if it did, if it didn't, if it didn't do that, you'd fall over. Okay? So we've got to talk about what's gonna happen now on the other side of your body. Right? And that's our cross extensor reflex. Right? So this reflex occurs while the withdrawal reflex is, is also occurring. Okay? So that sensory neuron, right, is going to stimulate, right, those inner neurons, right, that are found in the spinal cord, okay, that will cross over or decusate, and what will happen is those inner neurons will excite or stimulate the extensor motor neurons on the other side of your leg, on the other side of your body, okay? Not so much because there's really no need to. Yeah, but this is like more for when you're standing. Yeah. Why? Oh, I can yeah, fall over. <laughs> yeah. We'd be we'd be dead. I mean, when I say we'd be dead, I don't think our species would be in existence anymore. We would make it this far. All right. So now we're gonna see what happens. All right. So as your right leg. You step on a sharp rock, you pull your knee away, your left leg has to stay straight. Your knee on your left leg has to stay locked out, right? And what keeps your knee straight? You can even feel it as you're sitting there, 
right? When I straighten my leg, my quadriceps muscle group is contracting, right? So that's what happens here in the extensor, the cross extensor reflex. We are going to stimulate, all right, the right leg's quadriceps muscle, okay? And that allows us to support our body weight so we don't fall over, okay? So you can see that here in this picture. Same picture. All right, so here comes the nociceptor signal. It comes up through the sensory neuron. All right, it synapses onto this interneuron. This interneuron decazates, it crosses over, and it's going to excite or stimulate, all right, the motor neuron here on the other side of the body. And this motor neuron goes to the extensor muscle group right in the other leg. And it keeps your knee straight. You don't bend your knee and fall over. Right, and that's the crossed extensor reflex. All right, and last but not least, why do we care about reflexes? Why do doctors care about reflexes, all right? It helps us with diagnoses. You can tell for people that complain of multiple sclerosis and the early signs, Guillain-Barre syndrome, all right, which is a peripheral nervous uh, condition, uh, nervous system condition, all right? Well, anyway, if we're suspecting certain things, we can use these reflexes to help with our diagnosis here, right? Certain reflexes that the, the structure reflex, um, when they hit your uh, knee, right? That tells me right, I am actually doing the stretch reflex on your quadriceps muscle group. It's innervated by your femoral nerve, and the main spinal nerve that innervates your femoral nerve is L4. So if I want to check your L4 spinal nerve, I do the patella reflex on you. If I want to check your S1 spinal nerve, which is a big part of your sciatic nerve, I'll do what's called the Achilles. Has anyone ever had them when they tap your Achilles tendon? Just let them sit where their feet is, uh, are dangling off. And what I do is I just uh, lightly load the foot a little bit with my other hand, and I tap the Achilles tendon with the, with the reflex handle, hammer, and the foot will drop down a little bit. And so I'm checking the S1 spinal nerve. So that's what it does. What we're doing is we're checking the nerves, but also remember all everything that's involved in a reflex. What, what's involved in a reflex? Sensory receptors, because they're going to monitor the stimulus. All right, so if they have a, something's wrong with their reflex, I should start thinking, right? Sensory receptor or the sensory neuron, or something's going on in the spinal cord, or the motor neuron, or the muscles themselves. You have to think of all the players that involve are involved. So we can think of muscles. Nerves and then the spinal segments. That's what I'm talking about. L4, S1. All right. So if you have a diminished reflex, we call that a hypoactive reflex. Okay. That's what happened to Christopher Reed. All right. And that football player, when they damaged their spinal cord, they were paralyzed. All right. So that means, right, if they have a hypoactive reflex. I should start to think that there's damage to the spinal cord or. Something's wrong with the muscle. The muscle's unable to contract, so maybe some sort of muscular disease. Or there's something going on at the neuromuscular junction. Maybe enough, not enough neurotransmitters being released. There's something wrong with the acetylcholine. Right? Not enough acetylcholine's being released. Asthenia gravis is a condition that has to do with uh, the neuromuscular junction. Right? So something. If somebody has a hyperactive, this is when they have an abnormally strong reflex, and you're thinking central nervous system. Think upper motor neuron lesion. That's the first thing that you should be thinking of. Upper motor neuron lesion. Something's going on in the cerebrum or somewhere in the brain stem or spinal cord. Okay? Upper motor neuron lesion. Brain or spinal cord when you get an abnormally strong reflex. We call it clonus. So if you were to you know, when you go into the do doctor's office and they tap your knee, your knee just gives a quick jerk, okay? This person, when you tap the knee, your leg will shoot out and it'll start fasciculating. They can do it for 20 seconds, up to a minute or so. Then it'll relax. That's the upper motor neuron lesion. Main spinal cord, okay? So we call that just this with, uh, um, uh, I was going to say withdrawal, but this uh, prolonged oscillating movement period. Right, it's called clonus, and there's different types of clonus. I won't get into that. All right, that's it for reflex. Well, that's it for chapter 14. I like that chapter, by the way, as you can probably tell. Um, I want to just jump in real quick, briefly, 
to chapter 15. I won't feel good about myself if I don't at least talk about chapter 15 real fast. All right. And then we'll um, we'll take a break. All right. This is the autonomic nervous system. We're going to be talking about the autonomic nervous system, but I want to quickly review with you, all right, the somatic nervous system. Remember, okay, there's two parts to your nervous system, okay? And we're talking about functional organization. What's what, what am I talking about when I'm saying functional organization? Yeah, physiology, right? The structural organization is the anatomy, okay? So when we, the, the structural organization for the central nervous system would be brain and spinal cord, okay? So when we talk about the functional organization of the nervous system, we're going to talk about the somatic nervous system and the autonomic system. Somatic is, I say it's easy, it's what we're more familiar with. That's the stuff that we can consciously perceive and control, okay? So keep that in mind. Consciously perceived or controlled processes are going to be governed by the somatic nervous system. Okay. So our nervous system is made up of the sensory part and the motor part. So we have the somatic sensory and the somatic motor. Okay. So all the stuff that comes from our special senses, all right? So sight, sound, balance, taste, touch, proprioception, everything that our skin tells us how hot it is, how cold it is, how soft something is. Right, that's all going to be monitored or detected by the somatic sensory nervous system. Motor's easy. Somatic motor is anything that utilizes the skeletal muscle. Okay? So any part that any signal that comes out of the central nervous system that goes to the skeletal muscles that are voluntary movements, all right, are going to utilize the somatic motor nervous system, right? Also, reflexive movements, what we just talked about, okay? That involve the spinal cord, what we just talked about, and then the brain stem. The brain stem, that, that means um, cranial nerves, okay? Um, gag reflex. Has anyone ever gone to the doctor and the doctor takes a tongue depressor and jabs it in the back of your neck? That feels awesome. I love that one. Um, that's called the gag reflex, by the way, in case you didn't know. And what they're doing is they're testing cranial nerves 9 and 10. Cranial nerve 9, it's always the lower number that's the sensory portion of it. So cranial nerve 9 has the sensory receptors for your throat in the, back, in the posterior portion of your mouth. And then vagus controls those muscles for swallowing and whatnot. So it's going to be cranial nerve 9 and 10. Um, I'm trying to think of another. Oh, uh, the light reflex. Right, when someone shines a light in your eye, okay, that's going to be... Uh, your optic nerve, so cranial nerve number two, and then ocular motor, cranial nerve number three, is going to be the muscle because it controls the size of your iris. Okay? All right. So here's a quick picture of the somatic nervous system. Okay? Just a quick review. All right. You have the skin here with your sensory receptors from your special senses and proprioceptors sending information up to the spinal cord. And then if it's going to stimulate a skeletal muscle, then you can see that's the somatic motor neuron that's going to be traveling from the spinal cord, the central nervous system, down to the skeletal muscle. All right? So that's the somatic nervous system. Now, this chapter talks about the autonomic nervous system, your body's autopilot, stuff that's going on and you don't even know it. Well, you might know it, but you don't know all of it. Okay? And that is going to be, all right, our autonomic nervous system, all right? We also call it the autonomic motor system or the visceral motor system. But what's important is that all these processes occur below our conscious level. I don't know. Right? I don't know if my blood vessels are vasodilating or vasoconstricting right now, right? My blood pressure might go up by five points, right? My blood vessels have got a vasodilate or vasoconstrict. Okay? I don't know what that, what's going on. So when we're talking about the motor aspect of that, right, the central nervous system is going to send motor signals out to cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. That should be beat into your brain by now. I hope it is. You guys should know that. 
Okay, somatic motor is skeletal muscle. Okay, autonomic motor is going to be cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. Okay, and so these these effector glands are going to respond to any input or information that comes from our visceral sensory uh, um, neurons. Okay, so like I was saying, when a blood vessel vasodilates or vasoconstricts, or if it senses an increase in pressure. Right. Or like I gave you the example about the stretch in the stomach, right? As more food is entering your stomach, it's going to stretch the stomach, and that's going to stimulate the sensory stretch receptors there. And that will then enact that reflex there, okay? All right. All this is important in maintaining homeostasis. Yay! You guys remember, that's chapter one, homeostasis. Okay, what keeps us alive? Well, what technically keeps us healthy and keeps us alive. Okay, so we're going to keep all these body ranges: blood, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, um, body temperature. All that is going to be kept in a certain range. What's our normal body temperature? Ninety-eight point six. Right. Yep. And that's, that's kind of like the set point. But there's a range for our blood pressure. Uh, blood pressure. Uh -huh. For well, there is a range for blood pressure too. But for our body temperature, right? 99.1 is the high end, okay? And then 94.6 is the low end. So 94.6 to 99.1, right? All within those numbers, you should be okay, okay? It's funny because every day that I get my uh, temperature checked uh, almost every day, I'm always at 97.6. I'm always 97. 101 is considered high. Considered a low-grade temperature. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's not, not technically a low-grade temperature. That's considered, you know. It's, now, here's the thing. Some people can have a high body temperature outside that normal range, which is their normal. All right? All right. Well, and that's why you just go back and get it checked again, you know, at a different time, because it happens. I mean, you go, this is what I was worried about when the summertime was hot outside. Walk in from a hot parking lot in South Carolina to a building, it could elevate your, your body temperature, you know. And so, anyways, yeah. All right. <laughs> we went to Dollywood, and I think there was... There was eight of us. Four of us scored high on the body temperature. And they're like, just stand in front of this fan here. And then they had us stand in front of this fan. And then they took the temperature of with us in front of the fan. And then everybody passed. So I was just like, why didn't we do that in the beginning? All right. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to stop here. I, would, I could jump in and I want to. But I'm going to stop myself here. Let's stop here. Uh, take a break for about 10, 15 minutes here. All right. And then... Um,